Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry I am, you know, miles away, time zone wise, and not on uh, schooner o'clock. I'm still on coffee, I'm afraid. But uh, you know, we, we all have to. We all have to deal. And my name is Matt Johnson. Um, I, I'm a cloud security advocate um, with Prisma, as I said, via the Bridge Crew acquisition. Um, if you want to connect with me, I am here. We have a um, Slack channel where we talk about all things kind of codified security, DevSecOps, all of those buzzwords. Um, I've been playing with containers since before Docker was called Docker. Um, anyone remember Solaris branded zones? No, no, that's fine. Um, uh, and I want to be, hey, we got someone. <laughs> That is the first time that's happened. I would yeah, take that. I'm old. I'm very old. <laughs> um, I love it. Love it. Um, yeah, hobbyist pen tester and wannabe private pilot in my spare time. You know, all the all the cheap hobbies, right? Um, so I want to talk, we'll dive into Helm, but I want to talk mainly uh, about the story of a, you know, let's, let's take a, a day in the life of an app on a Kubernetes cluster. And, you know, I was joking that the children's illustrated version of that is coming soon because it sounds like the start of a children's book. And then I found out that the CNCF actually has written one, um, which is quite hilarious. Um, but let's think about this, this Kubernetes app. We, we, we need something to run on our cluster. It might be a third party uh, database. It might be a third party application. It might be a business application that we've written internally for ourselves. Um, are we going to write the deployment ourselves? Or are we going to see if it already exists? Or especially if it's a third party thing, are we just going to type it into Google and, and see if there's a manifest that we can already use? Um, and and there's, the, there's the Children's Illustrated Guide to Kubernetes. That is a real thing. If you want to go and talk to your family or friends or children about Kubernetes, uh, the link's there below. Um, but what's basically going to happen uh, for most of us, certainly myself, is um, we're not going to go, right, I'm just going to open a blank YAML file and just start typing Kubernetes manifests. Um, we're probably going to go to Google. We're probably going to find ourselves at something like artifacthub.io, which is a registry for um, Helm charts and other Kubernetes artifacts. And we're probably going to find that a wild download button appears. And we're probably going to download um, and try that that Helm chart to do the thing we need to do. Because writing Helm charts isn't our job. Writing Kubernetes isn't our job. Um, we just want to get that application deployed. Now, that's fine. Some people might deploy into a test cluster, see if it works, see what it's like. Other people might just go, yep, that works, and, and move on. You know, we've, we've all been there. Um, there's a copying and pasting from Staff, uh, Stack Overflow GIF somewhere in this presentation, I promise. Um, and so that's generally, you know, the whole code reuse, the whole expecting to find modules online. We've done it with code artifacts for years. And we see more and more um, public repos for reusable Terraform and reusable Kubernetes and Helm, like on Artifact Hub. So we go and download and run um, this chart. That might be the chart that ends up running that thing in production for us. It might, we might edit it, um, but it got us thinking. Um, it got us thinking, what if, you know, how many of these charts that we are pulling from kind of artifacthub.io and using in our clusters, like how many of them have a good security posture from the start? And so we went ahead and did some research. We basically downloaded every single artifacthub.io Helm chart that was available, um, which definitely didn't annoy their API at all. And we ran it through our infrastructure as code open source tool called Chekhov. Now, for the moment, I will just briefly introduce Chekhov. Chekhov is really designed to run in your CI pipelines. It's designed to automate, um, you know, having a kind of virtual security advocate on your team, um, having a look at your infrastructure as code, be it Kubernetes, be it Helm, be it customized, Terraform, CloudFormation, you name it. Um, and it really is as simple as this. You kind of it, it, and it's basic, it supports lots of frameworks. They're all enabled by default. Uh, like I said, all the other IACs, but I can just say recursively scan this directory. And if you find anything, run it through the built-in policies. And what we have here is me running against a PostgreSQL Helm chart, which we will come back to. 
and it finds a load of good things. So here we go. There's, you know, all of these have passed. Um, and all of these, all of these policies are based on kind of Kubernetes CIS security benchmarks. But then we find some bad things as well. Um, ignoring the namespace ones, I'll, I'll get to them in a moment. Um, probably, probably shouldn't have um, containers with, you know, admin capabilities assigned. Um, probably should enforce setcom profiles to make sure um, we're not leaving it up to the cluster to decide. Um, probably shouldn't run containers with allowed privilege escalation. Um, and you know, lots and lots of kind of CIS guidance. Um, memory limits again. We'll come to that. Uh, but just in a nutshell. Don't worry if, if these don't make any sense at the moment, we'll get to it. Um, but yeah, the idea is Chekhov can just give you a really quick view of, hey, this file, these lines, um, this resource, um, you probably want to look at this. And for each of the policies, we also provide a, a guidance link to provide a bit of context um, if you're not too familiar on, on what that issue is. He says looking for his slides. There we go. Um, so we went and did this research. And we scanned all of the available artifact hub repos. And what we found wasn't surprising. Um, we found that you are much more likely to find a misconfigured, um, just as likely to find a misconfigured um, Helm repo or Helm chart that doesn't meet uh, Kubernetes security practices than you are to find one that does. It's, it's literally nearly a 50-50 split. Uh, we had some rendering errors, um, but in terms of repos being like, oh, there's a repo that contains a load of charts that are absolutely tip top. Um, as you can see, it, it just doesn't really exist. You are much more likely to end up um, on a repo with a lot of insecure charts. Um, we broke that down by compliance policies. Um, again, we'll go into this. A lot of really concerning things like allowing root containers, um, allowing privilege escalation, um, some other things that do matter a lot, and we'll go into these when we look at fixing these common issues, like uh, CPU and memory limits not being enabled. Um, I, again, I will touch on this again, but um, CPU and memory limits are the only way Kubernetes knows how to schedule resources across your cluster. If you don't set those, um, Kubernetes really has no idea whether that resort, that app, that deployment needs one virtual CPU, 100 CPUs, half a gig of RAM, 20 gigs of RAM. Um, and it also cannot report or do anything about an app that maybe shouldn't use that much RAM, but suddenly is doing, because it doesn't know how much it needs. Uh, so the cluster can't protect itself from runaway applications. The cluster can't protect itself from you know, um, a uh, attacked pod um, running crypto mining and suddenly using 100% of the CPU on the machine because it doesn't know how much uh, resource that machine that that pod is meant to be taking. So you know other things like that that while you might not necessarily think they're security related, they are because that completely affects the stability of the whole cluster. Um, and this is not me saying don't reuse code, don't use Helm charts, stop you know using things from the internet. There is far too much code for anyone to write these days. Um, Going back to kind of application times, um, chances are about 90% of an application is dependencies that someone else has written and only 10% of the code your own. I'm not saying um, write your own infrastructure from scratch um, because if we look at uh, Terraform registries, we see exactly the same thing. We literally see pretty much the same like 40, 50% split of misconfigured out of the box repos. Um, Infrastructure as code reuse is awesome. Don't not do it. It's just be aware of the things you need to double check um, before you deploy. And the simplicity of why this is the case in both Terraform and also Helm and pretty much every other infrastructure as code repos we've we've done this kind of research on um, is the same old security versus usability problem that we have industry wide and you know has never gone away. Um, if you look at this Kubernetes manifest, uh, it's not Helm, it's just pure Kubernetes YAML um, on the left. Technically, that runs. Um, that will create you a, um, it will stand up an application. It will do the same thing that the manifest on the right that doesn't fit on the slide will do. The difference is 
The first one isn't CIS compliant with all the security requirements for a Kubernetes deployment. The second one is. The problem is, as a developer that's just getting started, I need my first Helm chart to do my first Kubernetes deployment. How am I going to know that all of those lines even exist to add to my manifest? Um, especially when they both appear to be working if I throw them up, throw them as a cluster. So um, yeah, it's it's that same security versus usability issue, and it's just about checks and balances and a bit of training rather than not reusing Helm charts from the internet. Um, but how do we go from that small one to that big one? How do we know what we are missing from our configuration? And I'm going to take my Apple Watch off because apparently Do Not Disturb is not working. Um, <laughs> it's just falling down the stairs. Um, so as I said, we have uh, open source tools called Chekhov. They actually, uh, the tool powers a lot of the code visibility within Prisma Cloud. Um, different personas are going to want to use Chekhov, the open source. Other personas are going to want to use Prisma Cloud. I'll get on to some of the differences in a second. But as I've already touched on, it's got thousands of built-in checks. You don't need like a policy pack. Um, if you download and run Chekhov, um, it has all those checks built in. Um, and it just kind of builds in best practices for things you should be thinking about within your Helm and Terraform and Kubernetes. Um, as I said, it's designed really for CI. You can throw it in GitHub Actions really, really easily. Um, and then you're not having to run extra commands every time uh, one of your developers makes a commit. Um, and once you do that, once you have you know, thought about, OK, that sounds good. I can, I can run Chekhov against my Helm charts and, and get an output like this to see what I'm missing. Awesome, great. You're going to run into two problems. Um, the first problem is where to start. Um, you know, we we regularly practice and preach the fact that misconfigurations in cloud are the modern day CVE. They're the modern day you know vulnerability database. You're just as likely to have an attacker um, compromise your systems because of a infrastructure as code misconfiguration as you are from uh, one of your applications actually getting broken into through a, a, a CVE. And so you need to check both. And you know CVEs don't go away. We're still running application code and applications and dependencies and libraries have CVEs. Um, so where do you start? Because chances are you're going to run Chekhov and you're going to run um, Chekhov actually can scan for CVEs, um, same as Prisma Cloud within images we find within Kubernetes as well. So you're going to end up with two sets of data. You're going to end up with all these potential infrastructure as code issues and all these CVEs. Um, that's enough technical debt probably on a regular code base to wipe out a couple of sprints. No one wants to do that for a couple of sprints. No one is going to do that for a couple of sprints because product management would get annoyed generally speaking. Um, so problem one is where do you start? Um, and problem two is security isn't a point in time snapshot. Um, you have a way easier a time fixing things from you know when the code isn't committed, right? If, if you're just writing some code and it's still in your IDE and you haven't saved it and it's not in a commit and it's not in a PR, then that is super easy, super simple to fix if you spot something. Um, there's no risk of the fix. It's not already in production. You don't have to migrate anything that's already there. Super simple to fix. But the available information you get, the closer you get to runtime, you know, um, where is it running? What CI CD system is it going through? Um, you know, what other things does it need access to? What are its IAM policies if you're an AWS fanboy? Um, you know, you have a lot more information the closer you get to runtime. There might be secrets in CD that you as a developer don't have access to. So you can only really put it all together with the integration tests um, the closer you get to runtime. Um, so security isn't a point of time. You really should be thinking about, you know, running the same policies, running the same checks at, at kind of every point in that, um, in that pipeline to make sure you're not missing something because it's all well and good having something secure in your IDE um, and not realizing that, you know, you've got a load of old stuff in your runtime environment, which potentially undermines the security you've put in your new deployments. Um, this was all kind of, you know, highlighted in more um, C-suite, SOC, uh, security intelligence, uh, 
team's research, our uh, research team, Unit 42, we worked on them on these data sets from Helm to look at, um, you know, to look at the kind of cloud threat report and, and how common these issues were. So a bit of further reading if you're interested. Um, but this issue, like where to start, um, led us on to this idea of blast radius. Like what is the impact of a given CVE or a given um, cloud infrastructure misconfiguration? And the thinking behind it is this. Um, this is going to sound like if a tree falls in the woods and it's not meant to. Um, if I have a load balancer open to the internet, it shouldn't be, but it's it's completely open. Public IP, every port. And that load balancer has zero backend services attached to it. Um, is it. Is it something I need to worry about? Is it vulnerable? Um, yes, it's misconfigured. Yes. Chekhov will scream at you that you have a publicly configured open load balancer with no security groups uh, on a public IP. Um, but if there's no backend services, does it actually matter? Like no one, the, the attacker isn't getting to any of your apps. They're not able to route to any of your internal services. Um, compared to, let's have a look here with a misconfiguration that leads to an attack. Uh, this is a, a, a diagram representation of a, a real um, attack in the wild. We have uh, an open load balancer with a misconfigured security group. And that security group was meant to limit that load balancer to the internal VPC or the internal uh, network of the cloud. I do speak in AWS language. I apologize for those that um, prefer the cloud Azure or uh, Google flavored. Um, but yes, yeah, so we have an open load balancer and it's exposing a internal monitoring endpoint uh, that runs in each pod, that runs in each deployment. Now, that's not meant to be public and it is. So that misconfiguration ends up meaning there is a monitoring endpoint. And because it's an internal endpoint, that isn't patched. It's not as carefully secured and tested as your, your public APIs. And so there's a CVE available within that monitoring agent because it's a, you know, a year old. And that can be used to gain container access to just the pod with the monitoring endpoint in. But then further misconfigurations or further defaults that have been left as defaults um, may allow us to use the default service account from within that Kubernetes pod. And therefore, we get lateral movement into the Kubernetes API um, and whatever that default service account will let us do. It might let us see other pods. It might even let us read secrets. Um, it might let us attack the Kubernetes uh, infrastructure itself. Um, so yeah, that's an example of an attack chain that does exist uh, with you know, a misconfiguration leading to, to more issues. Equally, it might be the other way around. Your attacker might have um, a real public service that does happen to have a CVE that gives them access to the public service, the, the public applications pod. Um, but again, if there are misconfigurations or um, defaults that haven't been thought about in the Kubernetes deployment, you might have a default service account, which allows lateral movement into the infrastructure. You might have misconfigured network policies, which allow the attacker to basically install tools in this pod and start looking around the rest of your infrastructure for potentially internal weak endpoints. Uh, and again, uh, lateral movement that way. And so we thought, okay, so these two are very different to this. Um, could we visualize this blast radius? So we did some initial research and we used exactly the same um, set of Helm data. And we tried to build a graph of um, containers, containers with CVEs, and how those containers are used within a Kubernetes deployment or daemon set or any of the Kubernetes objects. And then if there's any deployment misconfiguration issues that the Chekhov outputs, um, around that deployment. So the idea being that a, a graph with very few nodes on it would be a lot less of a priority than a graph with a lot of nodes on it, because that would suggest there's a lot of infrastructure misconfigurations tied to a lot of CVEs as well. Um, so yeah, just a couple of examples here. Um, was purely POC um, there were a lot of drawbacks. It's depreciated. We're not suggesting go and, and you know, if you're interested in the code, go and have a look. But uh, it was a POC web page. It's a point in time snapshot. It doesn't update. It was literally when we ran the, the last data set. It was time consuming to generate. 
Uh, and more importantly, um, well, two things. Number one, POC people like myself should not code production things. Um, and it gives info, but not actions. It's it's not particularly useful. Um, it's just more of a standalone thinking about how we deal with all this data in a security context when, you know, security is probably not our main job. We're probably just trying to deploy applications and, and do other things. Um, so talking of not doing, not allowing POC people to, to write production code, um, this idea was taken up by our real development team um, within the code security team of Prisma Cloud. And we now have this new in-production feature called the supply chain graph. And this is a much nicer way and much more extensive way of doing that kind of blast radius uh, prioritization. So you can see here, um, we have a Kubernetes repo. We can see the Kubernetes manifest here. We can see the jobs and all the uh, relevant misconfigurations that we can click in and, and, and view. And then if we were to expand that graph out, we'd also see any, um, any CVEs related. So we can kind of see a potential attack path all the way through that. The difference is you can click on these and actually get kind of suggestions for how to fix these manifests rather than just that graph, which tells you big graph, probably bad. Um, so we're trying to turn this into more actionable data. Um, and yeah, link there if you're interested in kind of reading up on the, the supply chain graph side of things. Um, and then as I showed that kind of diagram of easy to fix in the IDE, and harder as you go towards production. It is important to not just kind of run security tools at one point, either on your developer's laptop or on CI, CD, and go, yep, that's secure. Um, and so for that reason, uh, Chekhov also has a side project called Wolf, which allows you to use Chekhov and exactly the same policies as a Kubernetes admission controller. Now, for those not familiar with admission controllers, admission controllers, you can basically tell Kubernetes to send the deployment manifest to some third party service and then tell Kubernetes whether or not it should be allowing that um, deployment onto the cluster. So you can configure WARF with a subset, maybe just high criticality um, issues from Chekhov's wider set of Kubernetes policies. And um, the admission controller then just will not let you um, will not let you deploy that. So it's a it's a last stop of like, it, it's not a particularly nice user experience for the developer. It's better to let them know during uh, CI that something's wrong, um, but it will stop really bad things getting to your cluster. And at that point, I'm gonna kind of stop for like, that's, that's kind of context. That's the things we think about um, in code security and Kubernetes every day, um, how we got to the point of, of thinking about these policies. Um, I'm gonna stop for questions and chats if, uh, if there are any. Cool. Um, I've probably got a couple of questions just to kick off, if that's all right. Yeah, for sure. Even if it's not all right, I've got the microphone, so it's okay. <laughs> I will talk, yeah. So, so you're talking about um, Wharf there. So is that, I'm just trying to wonder, so obviously um, keep, keeping control of the security path as it goes from left to right is really difficult, you know, because you've got what, what's on my laptop, and then you're right. going to bake some sort of container of some description. There'll be some dependencies that get pulled in then. So you've then got a pristine bake of something that a tool says, yeah, that's okay. And then you launch it with some bash script in there that's going to install your log4j stuff, you know, to you know introduce some stuff at runtime. So it's really, really difficult. So I'm just wondering, um, there's the concept of signing containers. You know, once once you've actually done a scan of them, then you can sign them. Um, is that uh, if you do go down that path? Is that something that that Wharf can also work with as an admission controller? So it will say, "Not bugger off, it's not signed." Um, it doesn't at the moment. Um, the wider uh, Prisma Cloud suite does. Yep, um, we have um, and, uh, to kind of answer more fully. Um, I guess. There's always that nuance, especially with kind of open source projects like Chekhov and Wharf, um, what it does and what it doesn't do. And it is one of those kind of build versus buy questions, um, to be honest with you. So Chekhov is very, very good at doing um, infrastructure as code scanning. 
Um, and through using the, I'm just going to check you haven't frozen, actually. Can everyone still hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Um, through using a, a other Prisma Cloud APIs, um, Chekhov kind of surfaces um, other features such as CVE scanning, container scanning, and things like that. All of those capabilities are actually coming from uh, Prisma Cloud's back end. So, um, but because a lot of people use Chekhov open source, they find it useful to have a CLI interface to quickly scan a container for CVEs as well and things like that. Um, if you took Chekhov and wanted to kind of build a load of your own logic to kind of look at converting um, your AWS account back into Terraform or Kubernetes and then running that against Chekhov and then comparing those results in JSON format and writing a load of your own logic, um, technically you could start being able to do a lot of what Prisma Cloud does. Um, but Prisma Cloud kind of builds on top of Chekhov and gives you um, not only um, Chekhov capabilities, automated pull request scanning, um, automated fixes. So if we know what you're missing from your Terraform manifest, for example, um, you can click Submit PR um, or you can click Accept Change because we will annotate pull requests with extra bits of Terraform, for example, um, to add to your manifest to fix those Chekhov policies um, all the way through to runtime. So if I just quickly share my screen again, um, that that sounds like an awesome feature, getting automated pull requests in there. Here, here's a potential solution for you. Oh, for sure. Um, in fact, let me, well, I can, I can just show you on a real one if need be, but they look something like this. Um, and you can see we just kind of provide recommendations where we can. Um, we'll actually, as I said, provide the option to just click to add a commit um, into that existing pull request um, if it's... Uh, if it's a known kind of binary, hey, you just need to turn versioning true or encrypted true, things like that. Um, but if we quickly go to Prisma, you will see what I mean here. So not only do we have kind of supply chain, code security, um, we know what needs fixing here. Um, and I can literally just click submit a pull request against that repo um, and it will open a new pull request to, to fix that particular issue that's been identified. Um, we can also kind of see like the, the current open SSL version three vulnerability. Um, I want to know if any of the packages in this particular repo right now um, are running that version of open SSL because this graph pulls in SBOM and all the different versionings from the containers, from anything we find in the infrastructure's code, from any application dependency file. So like an NPM file or a pip file for Python, We'll look at versions in that for vulnerabilities. Um, but to your point, you know, this is where Chekhov really ends. Um, I mean, you can't get this view in Chekhov either, but this is where Chekhov really ends. And then all the other things you need to think about, like you need to think about your runtime. Um, do I have changes that have happened in runtime that weren't in infrastructure as code? Either someone's gone in and made a manual change, um, which was either someone trying to fix something at 3 a.m. or maybe an indication of compromise. Um, do I have things running in my cloud environment which were before all of your teams um, adopted DevOps? So there was no infrastructure as code to begin with. Um, you know, things like that. And therefore, you do need you do need to run the same policies against compute. You need something looking at your live compute environment. You need something telling you if you have drift between what we can see in your code repos in terms of infrastructure's code and what we really see in your cloud. Um, you need to, you know, consider your egress policies for networking and making sure that like your CI VMs and your Kubernetes clusters aren't just allowing random access to dial home to the internet. Um, unnecessarily. So, you know, in terms of a more complete end-to-end -end view, that's really what Prisma Cloud's targeting. Um, if you want to kind of get started with infrastructure as code, or you're a developer with a specific niche problem around um, around infrastructure as code scanning specifically, um, by all means, give give Chekhov a try. Throw it in your CI/CD pipeline. CI/CD compute is cheap. Um, you know, in GitHub Actions and, and others, it's basically free. So it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with having that in there for a bells and braces approach. Um, going all the way left, you know, we talk about shifting left and all those buzzwords. Um, 
we also have a, a VS Code plugin for Chekhov. So imagine just before you write anything, um, being able to open a, a Kubernetes deployment manifest and know that Chekhov's going to scan it. Same with Terraform, same with CloudFormation. And the same issues you might see in um, Prisma Cloud, the same issues you might see annotated on pull request, the same issues you might see if you're running Chekhov in your CI pipeline um, are going to be annotated right here for you um, so that as a developer, before you make that first commit, before you make that first pull request, you're going to see the issues highlighted here. Why it's taking so long when I'm demoing, I have no idea. I'm guessing it's as sleepy as I am. Um, but we'll come back to that and we'll see all the problems listed. Here we go. So within this, with, within this manifest here, we can see that this particular piece of Kubernetes, we can hover over there and we can see all the same checkoff policies um, that we would get with... Um, that we would get anywhere else we run Prisma code security or anywhere else we run Chekhov. Um, I can view them in a much nicer listed view here. Um, and we do this for VS Code and IntelliJ. So this is one of the coolest things, I think, um, you know, to, to be able to kind of have that information to developers right at the start of the journey, rather than feel like we've all been there. You feel like you finished a job, you feel like you're, you know, ah, oh, the pull request done, it's ready, it'll get reviewed. And then CI goes, nope, back to the drawing board. You've forgotten all of these things. I have no idea what you're talking about. That's never <laughs> <laughs> I've never, ac I've never accidentally put a secret in a GitHub commit. What are you talking about? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's one of those things, that, and I think that there's still, you know, there's still a lot of the bit bigger sort of um, companies out there where, you know, their security department has has still got to catch up, you know, with how, you know, with a very fast moving world as far as containers go. So this is actually a way by which uh, you can let lessen the blow at the right hand side. So just for those of you that don't understand the analogy we're talking about the developer starts to cut code on the left hand side and then commits the code in and then there's a, there's an automator a semi-automated process until that code provides value to the customer so uh, yeah it's a, it, it would seem to me to be a, a very simple solution just to get you know to give check off a try or whatever tomorrow like if you're not running anything like that at least you're going to be uh, for, you know, your boss is going to think you're a hero, first of all. But, you know, more to the point, you're going to be protecting your your own reputation and also the reputation of the company that you're working for by taking more proactive control of the, you know, the quality and security of the code that you're moving along, such that when you do hit that security barrier, so to speak, it's hopefully just going to be a small hop over a wall and not get face slammed into a great big security wall. Uh, For yeah, sure. so, that's, that's people. so people can do that. So I'm assuming that Prisma Cloud, you know, once we've been using Chekhov for a while, you know, Prisma Cloud will have a few more sort of bells and whistles to give more peace of mind to the, the yeah. you know, the CISO it's, and the infrastructure. It, yeah, it, it's... It's all that, um, you know, Chekhov you have to install for each CI pipeline for each repo. Prisma, you can just integrate GitHub or GitLab or, and you will effectively just be scanning all your organization's repos in a nice centralized place. You can send alerts to Slack, you can send alerts to Jira. Um, you can get that supply chain graph built up across like all your repos. Um, and we also do this really cool thing called smart fixes. So if we see, for example, within your organization never never leaves your organization in terms of data but if we see that like one repo full of terraform has like 10 check of issues or you know um policy issues in infrastructure's code but someone else's repo within that same org doesn't have those um and we see a lot of other repos that kind of have fixed those in the same way like they have lines in their infrastructure's code which are all very similar we will suggest that, hey, you know, six out of eight other teams have fixed this problem by adding these lines. So even yeah. for non-binary decisions like encrypted is true. Like, for example, I don't know coming from Chekhov or a Chekhov developer or a Prisma Cloud developer, I don't know what your organizational normal number is for like number of replicas. 
Yeah. It sure as hell shouldn't be one, but I don't know whether it's three, five, ten. Um, so if we see number of replicas in other people's um, repos within that org set at like six, then we'll be like, hey, eight out of ten cats has suggested six within your organization. Um, so we'll we'll give that as a smart fix and we'll kind of show them the stats. Like there are three options. Eight out of ten people have done it this way. One out of ten have done it this way. Uh, one out of ten have done it this way, and we'll we'll provide those those snippets so that people can see what other devs have done. And it's kind of like trying to provide that security advocate, that like virtual security advocate. So if some teams do have kind of maybe a, a security focused person, and other teams don't, we're kind of trickling that information through those through those smart fixes. And that and that would be another. Oh, I'm sorry for commandeering. I've seen that, that, that there are a couple of questions out there, and we will come to them. But I'm just saying that how how awesome is that? Because everybody, you cannot be, uh, you know, like a subject matter expert in all of these domains, like security. Right. Why don't we just let the devs fucking dev? We just want to dev. It's going to, <laughs> like, then, like, it's going to give me a clue to fix this thing. Then that's why you would love not love because I'm Scottish, you know, paying money, you know, to get Prisma Cloud because it's going to make your life easier and, you know, take out the, you know, the risks involved. Yeah, I I say exactly the same. Like my job is like a cloud infrastructure security advocate. Like I, I spend my life working with Terraform security, Kubernetes security. And yet I don't remember the whole CIS Kubernetes 1.6 guideline recommendation. You know, no one holds that information in your head. And if you do, because you're that amazing, you're not going to remember the CIS one and the Amazon one and the Azure one and Terraform. And yeah, it's it's just impossible. So we need these tools um, to, to help us for sure. It's, it certainly makes a bit of sense, you know, in my mind. Oh, news hot, hot, hot off the press. There's one of the guys in the audience, Luke, has uh, he's just trying to check off now and running it against the entire internet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good, Luke, I, you're going to have to tell us. I, tell us I, I, I saw Luke's comment and assumed that was like against his own repos and he's scared of what he <laughs> might find. I like that. Um, yeah, and, and that's really <clears throat> funny, actually, because... That there is that like no one runs a security tool and gets nothing and that's kind of what i was saying earlier about like what do you do if you get a thousand results um a couple of pointers for luke and, and everyone else um it's better to know what you don't know than not know like it's better to know your current security baseline um than not know it and also yeah. Chekhov does come with prioritization there's like a high medium and low ranking for all our policies so that couldn't at least help you a little bit to, to kind of work out what you really need to care about. Um, finally, there is, and I'm just kind of going back into open source geek mode now. Um, we have a really cool feature called baseline mode, where you can basically take run check of against an existing repo. And this is exactly designed for Luke's scenario. Um, you can run check of and output a baseline file. And you can save that baseline file in your repo. And effectively, that will like silence all those existing issues. So you know them because you've seen the Chekhov results. But if you then put Chekhov in your CI, it's going to alert on new issues making your repo worse. But it will effectively silence the existing baseline so that you can work out. Now you've got some protections to stop new things making it worse. You can then go and work your own internal plan for kind of tech debt rather than just having every developer the next day after you implement Chekhov in CI getting a thousand errors on their pull request, which you know is just gonna anger people. That's a beautiful thing. So there's no excuses for not stopping, even if you've got steaming big piles of God knows what coming out of your stack, you can always get that baseline there, which which uh, ha hangs out your, your dirty laundry. This is all the horrific state of current, your current affair, but you can then carry on from there and be alerted for any new stuff. So you're halting any issues you know, in their tracks. I'd better try and um, see if we can get through some of these other questions here. I'm so sorry, commandeering you here. So- No, no worries at all. Yeah, J James is posing a question there. He's asking uh, about how to, um, is there a way to implement Chekhov with um, existing uh, admin controllers like Gatekeeper? or Caverno, which is one I'm not familiar with, uh, instead of having to deploy another one? Um, yes. So, pardon me. You, if you're already running Caverno, um, 
you don't have to um, run the admission controller. You could use Chekhov in CI. You could use Chekhov to, um, you know, um, scan your Kubernetes uh, manifests in VS Code. Um, yeah, if you're already happy with your current admission controller, for sure. Um, the only difference, I guess, is the name. Like they'll pro pretty much scan the same thing. Um, CIS guidelines are CIS guidelines at the end of the day. Um, but the only difference is obviously your policy names and text descriptions around a, a Caverno admission controller blocking something deployed isn't going to be the same policy name as what you're seeing in VS Code or um, your CI, because uh, Chekhov and Caverno will have different policies. Cool. Um, James, you also mentioned a product called Conosphere with regards to image signing. I have actually used that. It's a very good product as well, which is cool. cool. Have we got any other any other questions there? Got another question here. Just check from Charles. Uh, does Chekhov have any any other or any alerting or metrics available, or is that only a uh, uh, Prisma Cloud thing? Yeah, if you want kind of multi-team visibility, like fixes over time, all the automated stuff, um, you, you're really better suited with Prisma Cloud. Um, Chekhov is really is really kind of a, a once run and done um, kind of tool. And then uh, I think there's another question about Terrascan versus Chekhov. Obviously not biased at all and completely opinionated. Um, Chekhov does kind of 10 plus um, IAC languages. And with the API key of from Prisma can also do image scanning and automatically detect images in repos and send those to the, the CVE scanning API and things like that. Uh, Terrascan just does Terraform. So, you know, personally, in terms of not needing multiple tools for multiple things, um, I'm always going to go check off. But again, I'm biased. All right. Any other, any other questions from anybody? I'm just seeing if there's any others coming in. Oh, my golden retriever's just got up. Oh, I shall ask him if he's got a question as well. <laughs> any other questions? Going once, going twice. Oh, I think I wrote down a question here, actually. What we got? Yeah, so how does, uh, I mean, it, it's possibly going to be the same question again, that, you know, there is other tools out there. You've got like your Trivies or your Sonar Source or your Fortify sort of stuff. Um, what advice would you give to the audience when it comes to having a play with this sort of stuff? You know, they've got, they have an opportunity to fix up some stuff, you know, how should they start? Yeah, for sure. Um, again, like big proponent in, like throw, throw tools in a CI pipeline, see what happens. Um, you know, you don't have to turn them on to block. You can just turn them on so you see the output. The person that cares about it can go and read them. The rest of the dev team, you know, don't have to care. Um, just just see what you get. And if you don't understand the results, like, you know, use the resources available to, to try. Or, you know, if, if you do have a security advocate on your team, be like, hey, I, I heard of this tool called Chekhov. Like, help me understand the output, things like that. Um, I don't really have, like, I know people that run Chekhov and like three other open source tools just to get the delta between, you know, Terrascan, Chekhov, et cetera, like your choice on that one, really. Um, and yeah, th there's kind of no harm in running it. Um, apart from the fact that it will feel like work. That's the only thing I will say. Um, I've got a slide at the end of it. Like, you know, you are going to get a bunch of things that you will need to do something about. Um, but it's surely better knowing those than um, than than not having a clue about the security posture of of your application. Yeah, you do have to sort of for, um, force yourself from unconsciously incompetent to be <laughs> consciously <laughs> incompetent. You know, I think uh, yeah, I think as I think as well, like IAC, uh, like you know, Kubernetes writing Terraform, like we've never had the opportunity before. You know, there was no way to like export your VMware configuration into a way that we could nicely scan in a single file and save in Git so that we could track versions and see who's changed what in our infrastructure. You know, infrastructure as code gives us the ability for this to be very machine readable. 
Um, so we, it's never been easier to like run a tool and go, hey, these are my issues. Um, yeah, so, so we should take advantage of that. So what about the super, super important question of uh, it's all very well, all these set tools getting stuck into our CI, but obviously Brian the snail from the magic roundabout is going to be quicker getting from left to right. How do, how do we get that balance to, um, to maintain cadence with all of the security tools? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think I think the, the whole, again, using the buzzword, I'm going to have to put a pound in the buzzword box. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I think that whole like shift left concept, I know it's a buzzword, but like, you know, we really do see it. Like I see developers that only touch any security tool through the, the Chekhov VS Code integration. So they're already being told, hey, like we're just going to add this line in your Terraform. You need to change this Kubernetes manifest. And that's all they see. Um, we get other people that literally just click all the suggestions that we give in a pull request when we go, hey, add this, add this, add this. Um, I think that is definitely um, the right way to approach it. Because I agree, a developer shouldn't be spending their time, like in my opinion, like the, the Prisma Cloud UI isn't for the developer. The Prisma Cloud UI is where you go and configure or the security team configures it across all the repos to get visibility, to enable these more developer-centric features enables the automatic pull request annotations, enables you know the API keys to give to your developers for the VS Code plugins. Um, if a developer has to like stop their job to go into like a security persona dashboard, um, yeah, I, I, that's not the way we should be moving. Um, but providing those kind of helpful information like, hey, add this to your, your PR or fix this while it's still in VS Code, I think that's the only way this is gonna work. Um, there's also some cool things we can do with CVEs as well, where if we do detect a CVE, we'll just provide uh, information on, we know that like this library for this Node.js, this CVE was fixed in this version. So, you know, worst case scenario, especially if you're a dev team that writes tests for your applications, just bump that version in your dependencies file, run it through CI. And as long as it passes all its unit tests and, you know, that that version hasn't had breaking changes, you should be good to go. Um, things like that, I'm, I know I'm making it sound way easier than it is in reality, and I appreciate that this stuff is hard, um, but definitely the, you know, the more we think about the developer UX, the better. What a good answer. All right, any, any other questions uh, for Matt? We've covered a lot of ground. We have. So I've, just need to say I've not. I've not actually fixed any of the helm issues we were talking about yet. Um, but I, <laughs> I have some. But I have some homework for those interested. I've. I've already. I'm already uh, ahead of that. <laughs> so what's what's our homework, boss? Yeah. Right. Well, there will be an exam after this. So uh, listen carefully. Uh, <laughs> give me a sec. Let me share my screen. Um, so. We regularly run out of time talking about all this wonderful stuff. So in terms of the issues, in terms of, well, okay, I've run Chekhov. I've ended up with, oh, oh he says. Hang on a sec. Put me off guard there. I've run Chekhov. Here we go. Against the Helm chart that I have downloaded before I've tried to run it against my cluster. Um, let's say I found some issues. I'm in the wrong directory. Well done, Matt. Um, live, live demos. Who do them? Nobody um, knows. Absolutely. By the way, just for those interested in kind of doing this yourself, on Artifact Hub, you don't just have to install it to your cluster. You can literally click this link down here and download um, the whole Helm chart so that you can easily run it with tools like Chekhov locally. So you have all these issues. What the hell do you do with them? Um, and we've basically taken this exact one, Postgres, and we've done a step-by-step, -step, step through of it, like describing the issue you see in Chekhov, um, what it actually means, and what the solution is um, to fix it within the Helm chart itself. Um, and 
we, we go through every single issue that you will see specifically on the Bitten Army um, PostgreSQL Helm chart, uh, just because that was the first one that shows up in Artifact Hub Search. So we chose that one. It had a few issues. So hopefully, um, and I'll put the link on the screen, that will be useful. We also did the same with a plain Nginx Kubernetes manifest. So if you're not using Helm charts, but you do want to do this against your existing Kubernetes, um, we have a step-by-step -step fix um, going from that really small Nginx deployment that I showed on a previous slide to the CIS compatible one that didn't fit on the page. Um, that's also documented as well. So I will just leave this slide up um, so that you can grab those horribly long links. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to join the Slack uh, channel if you do have any questions or you want to kind of get deep into um, Kubernetes security stuff. Um, but hopefully they will help knowing what to do when you find some of those um, when you find some of those checkoff issues. Awesome. Does anybody else have any other questions? Black link, please. He needs to get his credit card out, right, Matt, for that one? <laughs> Sorry, let me. <laughs> I am. I am rather noobishly on a single screen right now, so I can either share my screen or see the chat. Um, and it's either five pounds or one thousand eight hundred Australian dollars with the current exchange rate. Oh, I, I don't think the GVP is doing particularly well either at the moment. So beer <laughs> might be about the same price. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs>